Major support for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. And Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. As we begin to hit our full stride for family fun and leisure activities as we head toward the coming summer months, the fact and the feeling of the longest economic expansion in contemporary history is still very much front and center and with us. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William and so much to be grateful for and so much activity to still and to stern going on now. And we will look to some experts like Lou Ebert, CEO from the North Carolina Chamber and Grady Johnson, publisher from South Carolina's Business News will join us. And later on, it's hard to ignore the effect and the excitement of the Atlantic Coast Conference, the ACC. Sports play a huge role in our activity and our commerce. And later on, we welcome again ACC Commissioner John Swafford. Gratefully acknowledging support by Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. Please visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Lou Ebert from the North Carolina Chamber, Grady Johnson of SC Biz News, and special guest, John Swafford, ACC Commissioner. Hello, welcome to our program. Happy spring, gentlemen, and welcome to you, you both. Glad you're back. Lou, um, let's start with this infrastructure issue. Gosh, we talk about this thing. We talk about transportation and light rail and roads and, you know, the Triangle Transit Authority and Charlotte's problems and, and just getting places across the state of North Carolina. Grady, I'm giving you a chance, I promise. But in North Carolina, uh, Ward and I, CEO Martin Marietta, Marietta was here, and he made it a point to say it is the most critical thing in the state and it's not just critical to get infrastructure right but it's even more critical to figure out a new and and, and creative funding model yeah. absolutely yeah i think in north carolina chris we probably have the, the best problems you could have in the world they're problems associated with rapid and sustained economic growth and with sustained economic growth comes a lot of challenges and opportunities including how do you invest in infrastructure uh, I think as a state, we were probably by some measures 15 to 20 years behind in funding uh, infrastructure that enables growth. Uh, the good news is we're getting out ahead of it. Uh, unlike a lot of states that are waiting for Washington to come up with a plan, uh, North Carolina came up with its own plan two or three years ago and have invested an extra billion two uh, in a biennium basis in infrastructure. So we're, we're now, our, our biggest challenge in North Carolina is we have resources available to build roads and we can't let the jobs out the door quick enough for folks to build roads. So projects that were on the 20 year list are now getting done now. Uh, and some of the biggest challenges, uh, when you talk to highway contractors, if they had more equipment and more people, they could build more roads faster. So would you call it a crisis situation? Is North Carolina still back on its heels trying to catch up? You know, I, I think we're trying to catch up, but you know, compared to places like Atlanta and Austin that have let it totally get away from them, and it's a parking lot. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, compared to some place in the world or country where there's bad traffic, n North Carolina is not in awful shape, but it does impact commerce. It impacts the moving of, of goods and services. Uh, it, it, it keeps us from, you know, we have a lot of distribution centers in this state too. Uh, so there's huge challenges around getting ahead of the curve. And the bottom line, everybody wants great roads and no one wants to pay for them. So that, that's why our foundation a few years ago put together a study with the help of our friends at NC State and came up with about a dozen different ways to pay for infrastructure, including a big project that's happening right here down the road in Charlotte, uh, that I-77 project. Mm -hmm. Perfect example of an alternative way to fund infrastructure. Uh, you have toll lanes and non-toll lanes. 
uh, give people a choice. Well, we have will we see more toll lanes, and I, I noticed you said toll lanes and not toll roads. There's yeah. a distinction there. Yeah. Will we see more uh, proposals for toll lanes? You, you know, it, it probably has to be a big part of the future because a combination of a couple things. Uh, the gas the gas tax over time is a diminishing fund source, which is the primary way we fund roads now. As more people drive electric cars and don't use gas, uh, you know what happens to a gas tax. And we have to build roads uh, to accommodate growth and to be in a position to accommodate more growth. Uh, these kind of public-private partnerships are probably uh, the way that it, you know we're going to fund the kind of infrastructure we need to have to compete for the future. Grady, I know South Carolina is not immune to this product uh, pro pro to challenge this problem. Upstate South Carolina has a toll road, not really utilized like they thought it was going to be, and, and down in Dorchester, Charleston counties with Boeing and Volvo and et cetera, et cetera, you're almost choking on your traffic now. So, you know, and the Ports Authority is always saying we need entrance and egress a lot better. So do, does a lot of this ring true for South Carolina, and how do you kind of get out of your way there enough to fund these projects as well? well? It's like, like Lou was saying, it's, it's, you know, it's a huge problem. It's, it's a long ball kind of thing, and everybody sitting in traffic and dealing with this wants, wants it solved now. Nobody wants to pay for it, mm -hmm. so it's it's a it's a big it's a big problem. I, you know, I I believe that that uh, in, in the particular case of Charleston, it's it's going to start turning off the spigot for economic development. People are going to begin looking at a region like Charleston and just say, you know, the traffic is too bad. We're not going to move there, and so I think I think once you see that happening, I think then. The, the 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 will of the public may begin to change a little bit uh, towards towards funding some of these things and 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 uh, you know making some progress. Um, you know the other thing we've we've just you don't got, think I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you don't think they the pain they've hit the tipping point down in Charleston around this yet. I I th I think the 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 tipping point is coming, but I don't think it's hit it yet. I don't I don't hear anybody you know uh, the, the general public is not raising their hands going okay we'll will change our behavior. We'll change our you know, funding model. You know, if you look if you look at people in traffic, and I'm sure it's it's everywhere I go. One person, one car, mm -hmm. and um, uh, most most of the residents in Charleston, I believe, would prefer sprawl to density. And something has to something has to give. And Charleston, sp particularly, uh, I would say, still thinks of itself as a small town and not as a as a metro area. Um, that's going to have to change, and 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 you know some fantasy things like light rail and stuff that'll never happen down there. There has to be some other, other alternatives. Um, but it's coming. I mean, everybody's everybody's focused on it, like we were saying. I mean, it's it's a major well, major problem. I, th I think where both of our states find ourselves on this issue, though, uh, Chris, is it's a classic example where the federal government has probably failed to deliver on probably the one thing almost everybody thinks they ought to be really good at, <laughs> and that's making long-term investments in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what they've done year over year is extended six months, nine months, 12 months. And the kind of investments that states have to make, you, you, you can't do that on a six month uh, extension of a plan. Yeah, so not to speak for NCDOT, Lou, but um, you know a little bit about this, what we're talking about. How discouraging you think it was for states like North Carolina when uh, the Trump administration or Washington came out with this new funding formula for DOT? Yeah, I mean, I, I think most states probably reacted the same way ours did. It's like, boy, you know, in the scheme of things, for, first of all, North Carolina is already there. We're, we're leveraging a lot of state dollars already. And, and the idea of basically saying we're going to have this, what, trillion and a half dollar program and only a third of it's going to come from the federal government, you know, it, it, it's close to being a non-starter. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. When you look at the kind of investment we have to be making, you know, not just in roads, but ports, airports, uh, water, sewer, broadband. I mean, there's enormous uh, investment need to be made to kind of keep a state like ours growing. Uh, in about 30 seconds, Grady, Scanna, Santi Cooper, uh, un unresolved issues around around how that's going to be paid for and settled. How much do you think that is going to affect the fall elections in South Carolina? Well, I I think that um, you know th there this is a situation of, of choosing the, the least worst choice, right? The, Tallest you know, you, midget you can, in the room. You can, you can, you know, uh, you know, Dominion is making a play to buy, you know, so someone could come in, buy it. Um, the, the burden stays on the consumer 
for for the hole we've dug, uh, or you let the thing go into bankruptcy and the burden then financial burden falls on shareholders and, and creditors. Neither one of those is a good good scenario. Um, I have a hard time seeing how anyone in the political arena could gain an advantage over an opponent by by being a proponent, uh, an opponent by being a proponent of either one of those okay. scenarios. Do you think there will so. be a collective ire from the electorate against those in office? Uh, everybody's mad at everybody. Yeah. Okay. So right. yeah, I, and, and I, it's, it's it's a mess. Okay. I, I've just heard I've just haven't heard a, a very good solution other than the 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 case for business, which is uh, let this deal happen, let somebody take it over. I've I've not heard a good case for letting it go into bankruptcy. There might be one. I've just not not heard anybody articulate it. Okay. All right. Um, if you've been in Western North Carolina lately, you may have noticed this. Uh, this pretty dramatic equestrian center coming out of the ground in Western North Carolina. It is called the Tryon Equestrian Center, and the brains behind it, in mo it, it mostly, have been Mark Bellissimo, who did the same thing down in Florida with a national and U.S. and international equestrian center. He will be our guest on this program. And also coming up, uh, Governor of North Carolina Roy Cooper will be here, too, talking about many of the things that we are today, plus plus. Uh, according to Wikipedia's description of the ACC, the conference's top athletes and teams in any given sport on any chosen year are among the top collegiate competitors in this nation. Of course, our bias is obvious given our physical location. However, the Atlantic Coast Conference record or accomplishments does speak volumes. Joining us now is the Atlantic Coast Conference Commissioner, John Swafford. Mr. Commissioner, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. So I, I, I know this is low-hanging fruit, and this is such an easy question for you, but John, how, how is it that the ACC, over a period of years and now decades, does have mostly this reputation of having the best college athletes, the best college teams, the best winning record, et cetera, et cetera? Now, I know other other conferences might argue, but ACC seems to stay at the top of the house here. I, I think it's because of the, the quality of the institutions and the athletic programs that those institutions have, but it, but it really starts with, uh, with the membership. You know, a conference is only as good as the member schools, and uh, we've had tremendous uh, member schools from the very beginning back in 1953. How do you get to that point of those member schools? Some of the schools you think, Syracuse, it's right on the edge of, of the Atlantic Coast Conference, I guess to some degree, but a lot of people argue about that, but how do you, how do you describe as a group what that core membership's gonna look like? Well, I think at this point in time, you know, first of all, you have to adjust with the times as they sure. change. And the landscape in college athletics has changed dramatically over the, the last 15 years or so. Uh, our schools have adjusted in terms of our membership, and we've been able to stay ahead of that curve uh, and, and position ourselves for the present and the future mm -hmm. in a way that would never have been possible had we stayed a nine-member conference or even had we stayed a 12-member conference. And right now, we, we are a conference that runs the entire eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the largest geographic footprint of any conference in the country. We have a larger population and more television sets than any conference in the country. And I think that's what positions us so well for the future, uh, particularly when combined with the quality of the institutions. Mm -hmm. Hello. You know, Commissioner, I mean, the economic, uh, uh, you know, ACC as an economic powerhouse is, is, is probably uh, second to none. And obviously under your tenure, a lot of amazing things have happened. T talk about some of the things that you think have enabled the kind of growth that's seen from an economic standpoint and wh wh where you are now versus maybe where you were 20 years ago. What, what's been kind of key to that Yeah, success? Lou, good question. I, and I think really it, it ties uh, to, to, and to somewhat what I just mentioned. It, it really ties to the expansion of the, of the league. Um, had we not uh, expanded, uh, we wouldn't have had the opportunity, for instance, to, uh, to make the agreement that we have made with ESPN and become their partner uh, in launching uh, about a year from now, a little over a year from yeah. now, the ACC ESPN channel. Uh, without the geographic footprint and the television sets and the population within our footprint, sure. that would never have been possible. And that, uh, has had and will continue to have a dramatic uh, economic impact on the league and, and 
and that's passed through money basically. It goes right through our office and to uh, the member schools. And those dollars, that economic growth is extremely important uh, if our schools are going to continue to have the competitive uh, programs sure. that they now have and compete for national championships. Absolutely. Is there room for more, more schools? That sort of begs the question, can you, can you keep growing? Well, I, I, uh, I don't think so, but I, I'm, I, uh, when I took this job in 1997, I wouldn't have said we would ever be 15 schools as we are now either. So uh, you never say never in today's world of college athletics, but I think we're set and settled for a long period of time. Our, uh, our television agreements and our institutional grant of rights, which gives the league each institution's uh, media rights, lasts through 2036. Uh, so all of our 15 members are committed uh, to the Atlantic Coast Conference for at least that period of time. And in today's world, that's a lengthy period of time. Uh, the thing that, the one thing that could, could change that would be if Notre Dame decided to join the league in football. And if that occurred, we may look at a 16th member in order to have two balanced divisions in the sport of football. I don't say that because I anticipate that. I do not anticipate that. But uh, that would be the one thing that uh, might uh, uh, nudge us to, to take a 16th member. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk, you talk about the relationship with ESPN and clearly as an outlet, as a, as a, as a broadcast outlet for the games. Um, when you look at the challenge in ratings, and I'm not talking, John, about just whistling past the graveyard when it comes to gosh, is there going to be a decline in ratings? Will this be a trend? Is it going to be like NASCAR? Um, when, when you look at the importance of the television audience and you see some of the trends going on, what, what goes through your mind? How do you plan for a possible decline in, in long-term decline in ratings or, or in, in eyes on the set? I mean, what, what, what goes on in that part of the discussion for you? Well, that, that part of our world is very fluid right now uh, because you don't know uh, how uh, people are 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you don't necessarily know uh, what device they're going to watch live sporting events on. The, the, the real upshoot of what we have in, in sports is live programming, mm -hmm. and, and people continue to love live programming, uh, whether they're watching it on a phone or, or a computer or a, a television set. And uh, the other thing that we feel really good about as a conference is that we feel like we have the best partner we could possibly have mm -hmm. in ESPN. They, 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 they're, they're not called the worldwide leader in sports for nothing, and they're owned by Disney. So that, that's, that's, pretty two, that's two pretty good partners to be associated with. And, and so we feel very good about our ability with our partners uh, to be flexible enough to adjust to the times as they may change and, and how people view live sports. Yeah. Just thinking if you had a crystal ball, maybe looking out the next five to 10 years, I mean, what, what's, what's the future look like? I mean, obviously we talked about expansion and how people you know, view sports, but what, what, what do you think are some of the big trends that uh, might, might keep you awake at night or at least have you and other presidents busy thinking about the future and you know, how you might position yourself to be successful? Well, you know, I think, Lou, the, probably the biggest one in college athletics is, is what we're uh, already in, a trend we're already in, and, and that is what model works in today's mm -hmm. world. Uh, I call what we do the collegiate model, uh, but the collegiate model sometimes has to be uh, modernized. Sure. And uh, what does that mean to our student athletes mm -hmm. and, you know, how the, the, uh, the ones that are potentially going on professionally how do they deal with agents? Uh, what should they receive as a part of their scholarship? Sure. Some people want them to be paid. I'm not one of those, mm -hmm. uh, and nor do I find anybody in any of our institutions uh, that believes that's the best route to go. But we do need to maximize uh, what an athletic grant and aid is. And mm -hmm. we started that a couple of years ago when we went to, to full cost of attendance so that some of the peripheral costs sure. that are involved with a student athlete going to school are, are now covered, uh, whereas five years ago that was not the case. So we're, we're making progress yeah, there. But we have something in this country that 
uh, doesn't exist anywhere else in the world in terms of uh, getting a, a college education and competing at the highest level in your respective sport, whatever sport that might be, and, uh, and receiving a free education to yeah. compete in a sport you love. Yeah, and uh, it's unique to America and, and something I think that we uh, generally cherish, and, and it's an important part of the culture yeah, of our country. Mm -hmm. And you know, not not every student athlete is going to go on to become a, a professional, you know, in that in that sport. And so, so that that degree is so important. How, how much how much influence can can you exert to help graduation rates and things like that, so that so that these kids, when they come out of school, have have graduated, completed a degree. You know, I, I, I know that can can be a problem. And you know, what, what do you guys do? That, that's always the goal. Uh, it, it, it truly is and has been and continues to be, unfortunately, graduation rates uh, in our conference and nationally are on an upward trend, which is a real positive thing. And, and our student athletes receive uh, more academic counseling than they've ever received. Our universities invest in that, and that's a, a real investment in each individual student athlete. And, uh, and we need to continue that, and we, and we need to continue to tell that story because so much of, of uh, what you see in, in media, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but so much of what you see is related to the elite athletes that are going on to become professional in their sport, and yet 97, 98% of the athletes in, in our universities uh, are not going to make a career out of the sport that they play, and, and therefore the the educational part of it is uh, extraordinarily important. You know, the, the softer science, uh, Mr. Commissioner, of, of what the ACC influence is on students, on athletic departments, on university presidents, on on the on the colleges that are your your members, is the idea of ethics. And you know, people have an opinion on on Carolina's academic or sports challenges, or what happened at Michigan State's. It's horrible. But what vexes you around the discussions when it comes to ethics and how you hold the line that say, we don't just pay our student athletes but we act respectable and we do these things and if there's a problem we get to the bottom of it right away so i guess is at the top of the house at the acc i want to use that term again where do you see your responsibility in leadership to make sure that all the colleges that are part of the acc are doing the right thing well it has to start with an emphasis and that emphasis has to be uh, consistent and and ongoing and uh when things are good in that area, you can't ever take it for granted. When things are not, uh, I think we have to push uh, very diligently for the institution to get to the bottom of it, to correct it, uh, to take whatever uh, measures that go along with what has happened and to move forward. Uh, and, I, and I think we've got to continue to put the emphasis on individual accountability mm -hmm. and, and individual integrity because so often, what happens, uh, an institution gets painted with a very wide brush because one or two or three people involved with a particular program uh, take the wrong path and, and try to cut corners and, and bypass certain rules and, and regulations. Uh, and you just can't have that. And it's a real shame when that happens and an entire institution's reputation is damaged because of it uh, and it's the one thing that, uh, if you ask me what keeps me awake at night, it's, it's uh, uh, being bothered by those kinds of mm -hmm. situations because they have no place in college athletics. Mm -hmm. We have about a minute left, Lou. You know, I'm just kind of curious, when you're with your peer commissioners around the country, you know, what, what are the kind of things they share with you that they admire most about the ACC? And when they look at what, what they're doing and kind of look at what you're doing, what, what are a couple of things that kind of stand out for them as kind of a best practice? I think it's 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 uh, consistently Lou the the academic athletic balance. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at this league and its history and its membership over the years, uh, including today, uh, academically, if you look at, for instance, U.S. News and World Report, uh, the ACC collectively has the highest rankings of institutions of any conference in the country. Uh, each year, year in and year out, our athletes. Uh, lead the Power Five conferences 
uh, in academic performance that is measurable by the NCAA. And, uh, and, I, and I think that, that history of academic uh, athletic balance over the years uh, since the league was formed really is really its greatest identity within the athletic community. Mr. Awesome. Commissioner, thank you for taking the time. Um, about 10 seconds left. you have a favorite team? I have 15 favorites. Yeah, 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 I knew it. You're good at that. <laughs> Very ecumenical, Chris. <laughs> yes. Yes, Reverend. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to have you on the program. Thank you thank for you. your leadership and hope you stay around for a lot longer. Thank you. Okay, good to see you. Uh, Grady, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, I know you do. I'm not going to ask either one of you about that. Uh, Lou, good to see you again. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for watching our programs. Any questions or comments, carolinabusinessreview.org. Until next week, good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Novant Health, Sunoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.